Hello and thank you for joining. My name is Martin A. Smith. I am the president at Wealthcare Financial Group. Wealthcare is a wealth management, retirement planning, and investment advisory firm. We're located here in Peachtree City, Georgia, and we also have offices in Washington, D.C. and Maryland. Thank you again, and we're going to be discussing today women and money, taking charge of your financial future. And as I stated in previous uh, webinars, this is in continuing with our Pathways to Your Retirement theme. We want to make certain that if you are planning on retiring or already retired and have questions, that we can provide you with a, um, an, an assortment of answers, of responses that could be useful for you. So we're not going to just make one suggestion and say, this is the best path, the best path for you. We offer a number of paths for how you can engage us with your questions and or um, receive the education needed in order to make well-informed decisions about your retirement. So with no further delay, let's get started. We're talking about charting a course for your financial future if you are a woman and you're concerned about your finances, especially with respect to retirement. So today it's critical that women know how to invest, save, and plan for their futures. Uh, some of the reasons for optimism that we should consider is women have never been in a better position to achieve financial security. And thankfully, over the years, women have made tremendous strides to um, integrating into the mainstream of corporate America, as well as saving and investing. Women have a lot of economic clout. Uh, women make up almost one half of the workforce and women account for more than half of all workers in management, professional and retire, excuse me, and related occupations. Women own millions of businesses. We know a lot of very successful women business owners and I could name many of them. Um, I think one of the wealthiest women in the world is a Nigerian woman worth $15 billion. There are so many women who are successful in business, not just the Martha Stewart's of the world, but also um, small uh, business owners as well. Women earn the majority of all bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees. That's saying quite a bit. Women often face, however, financial challenges that their male counterparts uh, don't typically face. For example, women have longer life expectancies. Now, this is a good thing. The challenge is, though, if you're living longer and your spouse has passed away or divorced, then you have to take on more of those responsibilities, obviously, on your own without that additional support. Women generally earn less income and have less savings. And women are more likely to interrupt careers in order to raise children or to care uh, for family members. And women often invest too conservatively. And I can understand that because with some of the challenges that women face, they have to be, cons they have to be concerned about um, the longevity of their finances, about who they are providing for and why. And so if you have the need to see your assets grow, you don't want to take the same risks that you would otherwise take, or even that the same type of risks that some men tend to take, um, perhaps men, because men are more aggressive. The challenge with investing too conservatively, as we know, is that it doesn't always keep up with inflation. And you can miss out on opportunities for um, reasonable or consider, consider, considerable growth in the stock market as a result. So as we stated, women have longer life expectancies. Women on average live five years longer than men, and retirement dollars would need to stretch further as a result. Women are more likely to need long-term care and face some health care needs alone. Long-term care, as I mentioned in the prior in a previous webinar, is um, quite expensive. About 10 years ago, there used to be a number of insurance companies that offered long-term care insurance by itself, separately from life insurance. And today we're seeing both life insurance and annuities offer the sort of hybrid uh, riders, if you will, where you can combine long-term care with life insurance and or annuities. Married women 
will likely have to have a sole responsibility for financial decisions and disposition of a marital estate. That is quite an expensive undertaking and a lot of stress as well. So these are just some of the concerns that we have and that women have um, about um, their finances and with also living longer than men. Women generally earn less, and this is, this is just unfortunate. Uh, women who work full-time earn 82% on average of what men earn. Now, I'm married, and um, my wife has uh, a, a, an associate's degree in architecture and a bachelor's degree in architecture and a, la a master's degree in landscape architecture, and I have six daughters and a son. Um, I would hate to think that my children, my, especially my, my wife and da my daughters and my wife, if they were working, that for all the hard work they put into obtaining their degrees and becoming professionals in their field that they have to that they will still earn less than men in the same position so there are some challenges here with respect to equality that we need to address that needs to be addressed at least by our government but until until it is addressed and resolved women who work full-time um, still earn on average 82 percent of what men earn and this impacts savings social security retirement benefits, and pensions. So it has a residual and disparate impact, a negative effect on women um, for a longer period of time. And it, and it makes them more increased, uh, more vulnerable to unexpected economic obstacles, such as job loss, uh, divorce, single parenthood, illness, and loss of spouse. Women, however, are more likely to take career breaks for caregiving. And this results in loss income as well as loss employer benefits. And there's potentially lower Social Security uh, retirement benefit as a result of that. And economic vulnerability in event of, of again, um, divorce or loss of a job by a spouse. And then it makes it more difficult finding a comparable job. And lastly, flexible schedules can impact a salary and career, career advancement. So again, some of the concerns that women have and some of the challenges women face in having to, in many cases, be um, caregivers for children and or elderly parents, as well as working a full-time career. Women tend to invest conserv too conservatively. Let's take a look at this. So if you're investing too conservatively, then it means that your retirement nest egg may not be adequate enough to provide income throughout your life expectancy. And then there's a loss of purchasing power as a result of inflation. Inflation is not something we can control. So no risk, no reward. Low risk, low reward. But I will also say this, of aggressing, excuse me, of investing more aggressively also exposes you to more risk if you consider um, the impact of standard, standard deviation on investing. So if you're gonna invest conservatively because you are conservative by nature, then you've gotta make certain that your asset allocation is optimized and correct so that at least for taking less risk, hopefully you can achieve greater rewards and returns on your investments. There is no one size fit all. Not all women will face all of these challenges as we know, but it's important to move forward financially with these challenges in mind. And again, that's marriage, starting a business, being a caregiver for children and or for parents. So when you think about taking charge of your financial future, here are six things that you can do. Take control of your money. And my recommendation for that is start by working with your financial advisor on a comprehensive written financial plan. If you have an investment portfolio, 401k or IRA or a taxable uh, brokerage account, then you want to sit down with your financial advisor and have them prepare a comprehensive uh, portfolio review with a, com with a comparative investment analysis. That's taking control. And consider what your asset allocation is. Many times people who may not be well versed in investing and they are probably a little too trusting in their advisor would just say, oh, I have an advisor and just check that box and assume that all is well. Well, the problem there is that if you don't know what to look for and if your advisor is not explaining that to you, then you might not be receiving the type of returns or overall performance that you could receive in any given period in the economic cycle 
um, throughout a number of years in your portfolio and investing experience. So you want to take control. You want to sit down with your advisor, have conversations monthly, definitely um, quarterly. Sit down at least twice a year uh, with your advisor and discuss what's going on in your portfolio. Make sure they explain to you where we are in the market and how that impacts you. If you can't meet with your advisor twice a year face-to-face, -face, then do a web share, a web conference, sort of like we're doing here in this webinar. There's all sorts of software today that makes that um, feasible for you. So sit down with your advisor, take control. We provide in our firm a complimentary written financial plan, and it will save you about $2,000. Some firms will charge you annually to update your financial plan. We provide it for you complimentary. So really, there's no excuse. A financial plan that we offer is online. It's interactive. You can link your bank, bank account, checking savings, your brokerage account, your 401k, your IRA, and it provides an account aggregation feature so you can see all of your accounts in real time, including the, the performance of your investments in one place from your mobile device or your laptop, desktop, whatever you're going to use. Okay, It does budgeting. It projects your estate plan. It looks at retirement income needs. It looks at risks, uh, debt, insurance, a whole nine yards. So we highly recommend that you take advantage of it. In fact, it is the third option that is um, listed on the first landing page that you came to when you um, before you clicked on this link to what to view these webinars. We mentioned it right there on the landing page. The third option talks about receiving a free financial plan. So take control of your money. Become a more knowledgeable investor. I sort of alluded to that a little bit. I highly recommend that you start reading some publications. Now, in our firm, we offer a book list and we are eager to make certain that our clients are well informed. So we do provide um, a list of, of books that we will recommend to you to read so that at least your conversation can improve as your, as your knowledge and understanding deepens with respect to the economy and the market and how investing works. And advocate for yourself in the workplace. This is really important. One thing you can do, other than asking for a raise, which I highly recommend that you do do, and benchmark your skills to your pay. It's important because if you're working in a position where you're constantly required to take on more responsibility or to keep up with new technology and to um, synthesize information in a new way that, to add more value to your organization, Benchmark where you are in your knowledge, any certifications that you've received, degrees and the skills to what you're receiving in compensation. Maybe it's time to consider a pay raise or requesting one or maybe looking at a, uh, making a lateral move to a different position, either within the organization or, or with a competitor. And also with respect to your retirement plan on your job, there is education information that is available to you. Avail yourself of it. Your employer and the HR director has a fiduciary responsibility to make certain that you receive the information that you need in order to make well-informed decisions within your 401k. They have to provide you with access to investment professionals who can provide you with those reviews and sit down with you and, and discuss what's important to you about your retirement needs. So you've got to advocate for yourself in order to um, take control of your financial future. Plan for retirement. Don't wait until two years before before retirement. Don't wait until, certainly until there's a announcement or, or a, a threat of a layoff or a downsizing. You really should sit down with your financial advisor probably within the first year of your new employment and think about what you want life to look like in retirement. Consider this. You don't know where you're going to live in retirement. You might have an idea. But you don't know what the impact of taxes are going to be in that state. You don't know what the economy is going to be like in those days or where we were going to be with inflation or with respect to interest rates, if there's going to be a recession or depression. Um, these things are unknown. So you have to plan um, and have some contingency plans in place just in case some of these unknowns occur when you retire. One big unknown that did occur when many people retired in uh, December of 2007, by February, March, April, we were looking at the Great Recession and their portfolios declined 20, 30, 40, 50% in some cases. So you have to have a contingency plan for retirement. Protect your income and your assets. How do you protect your income? 
You protect it for those who rely on it and you protect it for yourself in retirement. One of the ways you can protect your income for those who rely on it while you're living is through life insurance because you have to replace your income. Your insurance provided by your employer may offer one or two times your salary, but if you leave that employer, your family still needs that income. And unless you go on the COBRA plan where you take the insurance with you, it becomes very expensive at that, at that point, you want to probably look at insurance outside of your job, at least enough to cover your income for those who rely on it for a number of years. And with respect to retirement, there's a way you can protect your income because there are vehicles such as annuities or bonds or things you can invest in and at least sort of um, chart out a retirement income stream for yourself. For those who are not opposed to annuities, I'm sort of, you know, on the fence because annuities are not, are not bad. They're not good. It just depends on what is suitable for you. There is really, um, in my opinion, there aren't really bad annuities. There are some that I probably wouldn't consider, but I think you have to understand that when someone is discussing an annuity for a prospective investor, um, you have to ask yourself, what else do they have available that they could provide to that investor? If it is only an annuity, then I would say, yeah, you want to raise a red flag. But if there are other vehicles, then you've got to at least dig deeper and ask why the annuity in that regard. Suitability is what matters most in this in this instance. So an annuity isn't good, isn't bad, is really what is suitable for you as an investor. But that is one way you can have guaranteed income through an annuities. And then as far as protecting your assets, the first thing you can do to protect your assets is to have the proper diversification and understand what diversification means with respect to where we are in the economy, where the economy is headed in the future, and how to diversify your portfolio to hopefully weather some of that volatility as we experience it in the economy. And lastly, create an estate plan. Again, our software that we offer, which is online, it does provide a estate plan sort of uh, structure illustration. So it looks at your entire life, income, expenses, debts, um, investments, assets, everything, and it will chart out for you the appropriate estate plan based on where you are today, as well as where you're going to be five and 10 years from now as those assets will grow. And that's a conversation you should definitely have with your family, your loved ones, your financial advisor, your CPA, and, and an estate attorney if you don't have one, and start thinking about the value of your assets and how you want your estate to be um, uh, transferred into whom um, in the future. Take control of your money. Realize you have responsibility for your financial well-being. I know this sounds like silly obvious but uh in this industry that i've worked in for 25 years i've met a number of women who just rely solely on their spouse and um not saying you shouldn't rely on your spouse but you have to also at least be a part of the conversation and i've seen both i've seen some cases where the husband lets the wife handle all of the finances because that just isn't his strong suit and again, he needs to be a part of the conversation. Both husband and wife together should be a part of that conversation. If you don't have a spouse, then you have to take responsibility for your financial well-being. Attend seminars and workshops if you can, the free ones preferably. Um, there's a lot of information online. Give us a call. Um, you could find financial advice and um, really plug in so that your your knowledge overall uh, will increase. And so that's something that you can do and we highly recommend it. Know your cash flow, okay? Understand your cash flow. Is it consistent? Does it fluctuate? Um, you know, know your cash flow. Establish positive cash flow by budgeting, managing debt, and living within your means. This is probably very, um, again, very obvious, but that last one, living within your means and budgeting, is, is huge, okay? Uh, if you have a Starbucks habit or whatever, you'd be surprised at how much money one could spend on that Starbucks chai tea or a cup of coffee on a weekly basis when you look at it over the course of a year and two and three years. So maybe there are some things you could cut out of your budget to put back in the savings category of your overall balance sheet. And again, managing debt is really key. One of the ways to improve your credit 
is if you have a credit card with a balance or excuse me, a limit of $1,000, whatever that limit is, try not to exceed 30%. So if you have a $1,000 limit, don't carry a balance of more than $300, preferably pay it off each month. But if you go over $300, excuse me, if you go over 30%, in this case $300, your credit score starts to decline each month. So manage your debt, understand that 30% or less is probably the sweet spot and the most you want to spend on that card. If you go over 30%, pay it off immediately, get it down under 30%. Create an emergency fund. Don't invest emergency money, please. I get a phone call probably once a month from someone that says, hey, I want to start investing. One of my first questions is, do you have emergency money set aside? If the answer is no, then I can tell you what's going to happen when you have an emergency. Your investment becomes your emergency money. And guess what? If you've lost value in that investment, if the market drops or the stock drops or the fund drops, whatever, then you now have a problem because you've got to make up that loss to provide for the emergency. So create an emergency fund. My recommendation is six to 12 months of your um, of your living expenses, six to 12 months, or six to 12 months of your salary, whichever one, but have that money set aside, don't touch it, you know, set it and forget it, so to speak. And then you can start working on your investments from there. And we talked about a little early, but st establish and maintain good credit. Understand also credit, your credit mix counts with respect to your credit score. So if you just have consumer debt credit, like credit cards, uh, the credit rating, rating agencies want to see a credit mix, almost like an asset allocation of credit, if you will, or debt. So not saying go out and buy a new car. No, that's this is not an excuse to go buy another car or get a loan or something. But understand that if you have a car note or a personal loan, unsecured or mortgage, and or credit cards, that's a credit mix that they like to see. And if you manage that well, then it's an indication that you're able to um, maintain decent credit. For business owners who are looking for business credit, in particular, particularly um, a line of credit, you may have pretty good credit, 700 score or higher, and say, well, gee, my bank turned me down for a line of credit. Why is that when I'm getting credit cards from the same bank or different issuers? One of the reasons why business owners are turned down for a line of credit is because in their business account, although there's transactions, they can see the cash flow coming in and going out. If there's no savings buildup that that business owner can let sit aside without touching, it indicates to the bank that you need to spend everything that comes into your account and you get penalized for that even if you have a half million dollar income if a half million comes in a half million goes out when they're reviewing your credit application for a line of credit unsecured line of credit they're thinking okay well it was great that he makes it or she makes a half million dollars but a half million dollar goes out so a line of credit means that they're going to probably end up with some debt that they cannot afford to manage well. However, if you are able to keep a balance of cash in a separate you know, savings account or checking account, I prefer that you link your cash savings account to your checking account. It provides sort of an overdraft protection feature built in for you. They will say, wow, this person, she's able to keep $50,000 of cash in this account. We can see that 500,000 is coming in and 450 is going out, but it sends a uh, indication to that lender, to the bank that if she could afford to keep $50,000 there or $100,000 there or $300,000 there, then she's obviously making more money than she needs to cover her expenses and some liabilities. So your chances of receiving a line of credit is is better if you can keep cash and let it sit there at the bank set clear financial goals you gotta start somewhere set a financial goal take the bull by the horns and begin set some clear goals for yourself how much do you want to save each month how much debt do you want to pay down each month um, what investments do you want to make each month do you want to increase 
the contribution to your 401k or IRA on an annual basis. Set some clear goals for yourself. I always tell clients that if you're going to increase, well, first of all, my recommendation is that you um, max out your 401k if you're able to do so. Today is $19,500 a year. Um, and if you're 50 or older, you, ever, you receive a $6,500 catch up. If you can max out your 401k or IRA, then do so. But start off thinking it, thinking of it like this. If you're going to contribute more to your 401k, just treat it like you got a pay cut, you know, or the job paid less. Get it out your system. Fight the temptation to contribute less to your 401k if you can contribute more to your 401k. You're going to be happy you did so later down the line when you retire. Become a more knowledgeable investor. There is always room to learn more and adjust your plan based on your circumstances. Now, when we talk about becoming knowledgeable, and in our firm, we are big on, um, on education. So if you're just starting out, get some basic information. Take small steps and learn as you go. And don't postpone getting started. Ask questions. There are no dumb questions. Just keep asking questions. Um, if you're more experienced, align your portfolio with your goals and your time horizon as well as your, risks, your risk tolerance and look for ways to manage risk. Understand what you own and why. Keep an eye out for investing ideas. Consider taxes, fees, inflation, and make ongoing adjustments. Now, let me back up a little bit. Okay. Understand what you own. Who's making the decisions to put whatever is in your portfolio in your portfolio? If you have a 401k plan and they offer target date life cycle funds, do they offer any individual funds or exchange traded funds that you may choose? If not, I highly recommend that you request through your HR office that they include some individual choices not the not just those diversified models but some individual choices in your 401k so you can make some direct choices not just sort of fit into the general one size fit all model okay because for life cycle funds to really work and here's the idea the you may choose let's say the 2055 fund and that may be the year that you plan to retire and the idea is that you start investing at some point 20 30 years earlier and then the portfolio goes from being aggressive when you first begin, and over time it becomes more conservative. So by the time you get close to retirement, you're not taking the same amount of risk. The portfolio knows nothing about you, really, nothing about your expenses, your debt. It doesn't even take into account where the economy is going to be, really, in most cases. And so if it's just sort of going to become more conservative over time, what if we, what if you retire and the economy goes haywire the next year. You don't know what kind of retire, economy you're gonna retire into, just like those who retired in 2007. Retired and think, oh great, the stock market's up. And then three months later, the stock market's down for the next year and a half. So you want individual choices because then at least you can make some decision and be proactive and have some active, not just passive, some active engagement involvement in selecting investments in your 401k. Uh, keep, you know, and look for ways to manage your risk. Again, know what you, understand what you own. If you buy stocks, whether your choice, were, they, were, were those your choices or your financial advisors? Look for ways to manage risk. Understand the importance and the benefit of asset class diversification. You can manage risk just by seeing if you're overweighted in large caps and maybe have a underweighting, if any, in small caps. Perhaps you should add some small caps to your overall allocation, some mid caps, some real estate bonds, international, and commodities. Understand how risk management works in light of the economic cycle, which changes because every session in the cycle, and it goes from re recession, trough, recovery, expansion, peak, recession, trough, recovery, expansion, peak, sort of like a camel, you know? So each of those sessions in the economic cycle will favor it tends to favor one or two different asset classes at any given time. In a recession, we tend to find that real estate, real estate investment trusts increase. Why? Because interest rates are dropping in a recession because the Federal Reserve wants to incentivize companies to hire more employees. And as a result, they reduce interest rates. And then people start buying more homes. 
So there are asset classes, some that does better than others during a recession. It's important to understand how the economy impacts the market and what asset classes to make certain are in your portfolio so that you can have a better investing experience overall. And then, of course, have a game plan for volatile markets. Don't wait until your coworker says, maybe you should sell. In fact, don't even listen to the advice of your coworker about your portfolio. Talk to a seasoned professional financial advisor and let she or he uh, provide you with some wisdom with respect to how to manage your portfolio. Become a more knowledgeable investor. Admit mistakes and move on. Okay. Do not um, stew over mistakes. Don't cry over spilt milk. Just move on. Mistakes happen. It's called being human. Be risk averse in the right way, not in the wrong way. Don't be risk averse because of fear or because of greed. Be risk averse because you have knowledge about how the economy may impact the balance and the allocation and the performance of your portfolio. Be risk averse because you understand that maybe a particular asset class, sector, or stock that is represented by an industry in your portfolio may be adversely affected by what may happen either in the stock market, in a corporation, geopolitically with respect to interest rates, or the economy as a whole. Put knowledge behind that decision to be risk averse is what I'm saying, basically. No account numbers and passwords. This is, you know, this is sort of obvious, right? I mean, just, I use, um, there's some softwares out there like Dashlane where you can just store a bunch of passwords for various softwares that you may use. And so it becomes very convenient because you start to accumulate passwords over time and you may forget. So it's important to have access to that at your fingertips and not have to sort of, you know, look on post-it notes or whatever to figure out what the password was. Um, know when to get help. There's a lot of people offering help and advice. Know when to get it. If you have a question about the economy and the market, any financial advisor worth his or her salt should be willing to take a phone call and answer your question. Okay. If you if you feel that you need to call a professional, but don't want to engage that professional and they don't want to provide you with advice, move on. Um, not the person you want to hire, but know when to get help. And I think you should just make the educational process a part of your lifestyle with respect to investing from here on out. I mentioned advocating for yourself in the workplace. And I kind of I kind of gave away the uh, the advice early on. And um you know, so I'm going to be a little redundant here, but negotiate your starting salary. I can't tell you how important that is. No one you know, when I first started working in the corporate world years ago, I didn't know how to negotiate a starting salary. Uh, I didn't know. I just I was just happy that the salary was about 15000 more than I had ever made in my life, and I was happy to accept it and um, didn't know I could have negotiated and received potentially an extra 30000 on top of that for, my, you know, for what I was bringing to the marketplace at that time. And so that didn't go so well for me. But I learned from that mistake, and trust me, I negotiated very well for future salaries. This is before I got in this business as a, a wealth management advisor. Um, you know, you're going to have more to save and invest. So think about that. If you know that you want to save a certain amount of money, um, and a salary is seventy-five thousand or eighty-five thousand dollars, and your goal is to max out your four hundred one k, then tell your employer, "Hey, you know, I want more money." Um, you got to sell yourself, but sure, find the value that you can offer so that your salary will help you achieve your goals because being able to max out your 401k is huge. And um, if you can do so, then by all means, and if you can max out your IRA along with that, even better. Your salary is a foundation for other benefits. It's also the foundation for other investment opportunities that may exist outside of your traditional 401k or IRA, such as real estate. Research your ongoing salary, please. And I'm, I'm, you know, most women know this, you know, um, so I almost feel embarrassed even saying it as it's here in the slide, but just research your ongoing salary. Think about benchmarking 
your skill set and who and where you are with respect to others in your profession throughout the country. And, um, you know, I think it's always important to sort of make your self known in the sense of uh, not being shy. Just make certain that you advocate for you as best as possible and always and ask for as much flexibility as you need. Make certain your employer knows the value you bring to that organization and why giving you more flexibility is going to result in more value that you can bring to that organization as a result. Continuing, advocating for yourself in the workplace. You want job flexibility? Pursue it. Telecommuting. Telecommuting is, <laughs> is wonderful. I used to do it when I worked for the government. And there's peace of mind with telecommuting. I think everyone should have telecommuting as a part of their work options. Most jobs should offer it. Maybe work from home once or twice a week. You know, maybe five days a month you could work from home. It's, it's, that is a phenomenal um, sort of way to, to um, acquire peace for yourself when you can work in your own environment. So perhaps advocating for telecommuting is, 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 is truly important. Flexible hours is key. Uh, working part-time when needed is, is something that you want to consider. And think about the growth trend in your industry. Think about, again, the growth trend in your position, in your profession to that organization to make certain that they are always um, aware of the value that you bring. Now, let's think about retiring, retirement. So the age you start receiving saving for retirement is listed in this column here, 20, 30, 50, 60, whatever. And if you save 2000 a year for 20 years, at 65, you're going to have $425,000. You start at age 30, just 10 years later, you're going to have $222,000. If you start, of course, at age 50, in 15 years, $46,000. $5,000 a year at age 20, by 65, a million, 63000 and so forth. 10000 a year. At age 20, 2 million bucks by 65. You start at age 40, you still have $548,000. You're talking about saving $700 to $800 uh, a year. I mean, excuse me, per month, starting at age 40 to achieve $548,000. If you're able to do this as well as potentially max out your 401k, you have probably safe to say a million dollars or more by the time you retire. So planning for retirement, save as much as you can. Time flies. Oh, my goodness. Think about where you're able to cut expenses. Save. Save aggressively. Think about everything that you could spend money on as, as something that wants to take money from you. Take a little piece of your retirement from you. Take a little piece of your retirement comfort and security from you in the present and try to do it out. So you can have more later. Mm -hmm. Put yourself first. Well, that's exactly what we're talking about. Of course, I mentioned this a lot. Max out your 401k and 403b. Consider IRAs, traditional IRAs, spousal IRAs, and set a savings goal. And benchmark, benchmark, benchmark. Keep track of your progress. Now, Social Security it is the major source of guaranteed lifetime income for most Americans. Now, it's important that you know that the cost of living adjustment in Social Security today is about 2.8%. It used to be as high as 11%, an average about 7.5%. It's come down quite a bit. So why is that? We have fewer workers contributing to the Social Security fund, and the cost of living adjustment for Social Security has come down dramatically, but inflation continues to rise. So we got to be careful if we think about that source of guaranteed lifetime income. By the year 2034, just in about 14 years from now, you're going to have about 25% fewer Americans contributing to the Social Security fund. So imagine you're relying on benefits from Social Security in 15 years, how is that going to impact the projections that you receive every year, six weeks before your birthday that says, this is how much your Social Security is going to be if you retire at age 62 and start taking benefits? 
We'll wait until 870. Um, hate to paint a grim picture, but you're going to have to take this bull by the horns and save as much as you possibly can. We know that Social Security provides retirement benefits and Social Security also provides disability and survivor benefits. To qualify for retirement benefits, you generally need 40 credits, 10 years of work. Or you can qualify for spousal benefits based on your spouse's work record, which is about 50%. Your benefits is based on the number of years you've worked and amount you have earned. You want to receive an estimate of your monthly retirement benefit at, here's a website, okay? And I'm sorry, I should have done this earlier. I did this in previous um, webinars, my little pointer here. So there's a website. Use the retirement estimator tool and review your personal statement. Again, the age at which you can start claiming benefits, it matters. If you start claiming benefits at age 62, you're gonna receive 25 to 32, 30% less. If you wait until full retirement age, you're probably gonna receive about 30% more. So, you know, actually 70, um, you're gonna receive more. But again, just think about that because some people can't afford to wait. If you're in good health and you can't afford to wait, wonderful. If you can't afford to wait, but you retire at like 58, then you've got about a four year blackout period before benefits can begin for yourself. So you wanna think about that because you have the force of inflation increasing, not knowing if you're gonna retire in a higher interest rate environment, which is gonna affect any fixed income assets in your portfolio. And you're gonna to have to uh, pay yourself probably from your, your portfolio, uh, your 401k, your IRA for those four years more so before social security kicks in to offset uh, that income that you take. Plan for retirement. Monthly payouts depend on age you start taking benefits. In this example, $1,300 at age 62 or about $1,000 more at age 70. An eight year delay can make a substantial difference. Other things to think about. When you retire, I mentioned earlier, because you want to think about where you want to retire too, and what your expenses are going to be. And this is what we help you with in our complimentary financial plan, our online software that we offer. And deal with the shortfall, also known as the blackout period, because the day you retire and the day you take Social Security, assuming that there's a gap in the, between the two, that's the period of time you've got to fill with extra money from your tax-deferred investments, which means that you're going to have taxes to pay. Consider your health care expenses. Huge. Um, another reason you've got to save as much as possible. Health care is expensive. As you know, longevity issues, that's a great thing to live long, but costs more. And your distribution options, you have to think through how you're gonna take the income and from where, which accounts to tap into first and what your withdrawal rate should be. Because if you withdraw too much money, one, you could run out of money sooner. If uh, the market drops and you're relying on the stock market, to give you growth so you can liquidate some investments to put in the order to pay you cash in the present. And if the market drops, then you're gonna have to withdraw more to make up the difference. So you wanna find a safe withdrawal rate for yourself so that you can uh, extend the life of your savings. Protect your income and your assets, life insurance. Here, if you, if you have insurance, um, you don't wanna be underinsured you don't want to be overinsured. You want to be adequately insured. If you have a policy that you've owned for at least maybe seven years, five to seven years, then there's no harm in having a comparative analysis prepared for you, illustration to see if you might be able to either use the cash value to lock in better benefits than a new policy or increase the face amount, or even if you even need that much face amount to begin with. But uh, you want to have your insurance and annuities reviewed maybe every three years. Disability insurance is huge. If you're self-employed 
and if you talk for a living like I do, um, if you have a activity that is essential in your employment or self-employment for the protection of your income, then disability insurance is vital. Of course, we know home and auto insurance is, <laughs> is important. And again, health insurance, long-term care, really key. There's a sweet spot in age where long-term care, what makes more sense to get long-term care. I don't think you should get it when you're in your 30s or your 40s. And if you wait too far in your 60s, it can be a little, very expensive. But probably in your mid-50s is that age range where it makes more sense to look at long-term care. Because then you could you have enough time for the cash value to grow and for the benefits to accumulate so that if you have a long-term care need in the future in your late 70s or 80s, then you have enough benefit to cover. The um, average long-term cost, long-term care costs for Americans, for 7 in 10 Americans age 65 and older, is $280,000 per couple, or about $82,000 per year, okay? And that's for an average of three years um, at $82,000. Work with your financial advisor. They can offer some suggestions and make recommendations to you uh, for for a to an estate planning attorney who can help you with a living trust. It's important. If you just have a will, you've done the first step. I commend you. Problem is, if you don't have a trust, your children are going to have to go through probate court to make certain that your will is valid that it reflects your interests so that your estate and your assets will transfer to your children or your intended beneficiaries. So you have more lawyer's fees in the future and more court costs in the future. If you do a, if you set up a living trust in the present, costs might range between $2,000 to $3,000 for the trust. But if you pass away or when you do, your assets simply transfers right over to your beneficiaries. In many cases, bypassing the probate court process. A lot more efficient, a lot more convenient, and a lot less headache for those who have to um, deal with your estate when you're gone. And business entities. That's one way you can protect your income. If you own a business and you have a business that um, is generating income and you got savings, think about an entity because if your business is sued, and if you don't have an LLC or a corporation of some sort, then your personal assets are at risk. So imagine you just retired, bought a nice lake house. You have your, you know, your nice car or whatever it is, your home. You start a consulting business on the side, but you don't incorporate your business properly. You get sued. Now your personal assets are at risk, the lake house, the car, whatever it is. Set up the right entity, work with your business attorney to help you with that so that you can protect your personal assets. Now, just to reiterate about creating an estate plan, and this is key, and I've done already two prior uh, uh, work webinars, one on estate planning basics, another on advanced estate planning. So if you're watching this webinar first and you want to get more information about estate planning, I highly recommend you go back and look at the other two webinars I've already recorded and uploaded on estate planning. But to reiterate in this regard, an estate plan is simply a map that reflects the way you want your personal and financial affairs to be handled in the case of your death or incapacity. If you do not have an estate plan, I guarantee you the state and the federal government has an estate plan for you. And their plan is a lot more expensive than you having a plan in place yourself. So if you think about estate planning, creating a plan, your living will, your health care proxy, this is at incapacity. This is why you're living. Health care proxy will um, be the person that helps you make health care related decisions. Do not resuscitate order. This is sort of, um, you know, sad and morbid to a degree, but incapacity do you want to be resuscitated or not? These are aspects of your estate plan that's important. You don't want people making this decision for you. You want to make this decision for yourself. Who's your power of attorney? And 
Do you need a living trust? My suggestion, yes. At death, your will has to be reviewed to make certain that it's accurate. A testamentary trust is created if you don't have a will at death. I'm excuse, excuse me, if you don't have a trust at death, then a testamentary trust is established. No will and testacy laws. Will or no will, some property acts will pass automatically to in joint ownership or joint name. Other assets, you may have to go to court and fight for. I've seen this situation occur before where there was a um, husband who had who was on his, who was married to his third wife and didn't update his estate plan so the first spouse was named as a beneficiary second spouse wasn't third spouse wasn't and passes away wanted everything to go probably to the third spouse but the first spouse was able to receive everything because of the lack of proper estate planning Overcoming unexpected ob obstacles. Well, let's talk about that. Plan for job loss. Understand how the economy can and will impact your employer and whether or not your position in that organization is value added enough so that if there is a recession or a major downturn in the economy, whether your job is going to be at risk. And um, other things to plan for unplanned pregnancies. Um, divorce, illness, financial help for children, for adults and children, caring for aging parents and or loss of a spouse. These are some of the unexpected obstacles that women face. And it's best to have a plan. It's best to work with an advisor to assist you in planning for these things. And ultimately, that's going to, in many cases, mean saving for emergencies if you're not doing it already. So what financial course will you chart? It's all about you. It's about your goals, dreams, and security. And in the Wealthcare Financial Group, we say it's about your values, your needs, and your goals. So that's somewhat similar. I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, view this webinar. And again, I'm your host. My name is Martin A. Smith, and I am a financial advisor, a retirement planning, a chartered retirement planning counselor as well as an accredited investment fiduciary analyst. We are a wealth management and investment advisory firm and a state registered investment advisor. To contact us or schedule an appointment, you can simply call us right here or send an email. Thank you so much, and we look forward